The collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, the 18th largest American bank in assets, on March 11th sent shockwaves across the global financial markets. Up to its collapse, Moody's gave it an A rating, and only a month earlier, the Forbes magazine had included it in its ranking of the top 20 American banks. After the fall of Lehman Brothers in 2008, the United States spent almost a decade on an overhaul of the regulatory system to ensure something like this does not happen. So how could it happen again, especially the way it did? Who dropped the ball? What should be done now? What is the trade? Hi, I'm David Wu, a former Wall Street strategist with a 20-year track record on making actionable predictions about major global change. Welcome to The Money Game, where I take on groupthink, propaganda, and conspiracy theories in my critical analysis of markets, economics, and politics. Before we begin, please hit subscribe and the bell button so that you will be notified when a new video comes out. Governments have a tendency to fight the last war. Some politicians are already calling for making changes to banking regulations to prevent the crisis from happening again. Yet it was not so long ago that the United States rewrote the rule book for banks. The financial crisis of 2008 resulted in dramatic tightening of banking regulations by imposing more stringent capital and liquidity requirements. Regulations come at a cost, sometimes at a great cost. The toughening of banking regulations post-2008 was a major reason why the economic recovery after the end of the Great Recession was so anemic. This was because the new regulations forced the banks to hoard capital and liquidity. As a result, banks rein in credit supply. Tighter credit supply resulted in slower economic growth. The tougher regulations also forced the banks to buy more liquid bonds, such as U.S. government bonds. To meet the higher so-called liquidity coverage ratio, banks increased their holdings of U.S. government bonds from $1.3 trillion in 2009 to $4.7 trillion by 2022. Believe it or not, this helped sow the seeds of the present crisis. As the main concern about Silicon Valley Bank and the health of American banks more generally is the unrealized losses associated with banks' securities holdings. Most of these security holdings are U.S. government bonds or similarly liquid bonds. At the end of 2022, these losses stood at more than $600 billion. Silicon Valley Bank was an extreme case, with U.S. government bonds and mortgage-backed securities accounting for more than 50% of its assets before it failed. But even Bank America, the second largest bank in the country, is sitting on more than $100 billion of unrealized losses. But before we rush to tighten regulations again, we want to make sure that we don't create new holes when we're trying to plug old ones. Some people would argue that the problem with U.S. banks is not their substantial exposures to government bonds, but the fact that they failed to protect these exposures when interest rates started to go up. In the case of Silicon Valley Bank, there's no denying that its management took on excessive interest rate risk that backfired in a big way. However, for the broader banking system, this reasoning that the banks only have themselves to blame makes sense only to an extent. This is because hedging $4.7 trillion of government bonds is no easy matter. $4.7 trillion of bonds are more than 20% of the total outstanding marketable U.S. government bonds of $22 trillion. $4.7 trillion of bonds are three times the size of the net supply of U.S. government bonds in fiscal year 2022. In other words, $4.7 trillion of bonds is a lot of bonds. Had the banking system decided to hedge even half of its bond holdings in 2022, the bond market would have had a serious meltdown. Moreover, the meltdown would have destabilized the entire banking system, likely crashing the interest rate sensitive sectors like the housing market. While it is politically convenient to blame the banks for the present crisis, the crisis is just one of the many causes of misguided regulations and, most importantly, the massive increase in U.S. government debt over the past 15 years that have made the entire financial system more vulnerable to interest rate risk.
bond yield surge in 2022. 10-year Treasury yields started the year at just 1.4%. By October, it was at 4.2%. It was the worst performance of US bonds in 250 years. For the banks to have hedged against their interest rate risk before bond yields started to go up, they would have had to think that interest rate risk was high enough to warrant taking precaution. To have reached that conclusion, they would have had to realize that the risk of inflation was high. No doubt, bankers have paid a lot of money to anticipate exactly this kind of risk. However, banks also take their cues from their regulator. The Federal Reserve, as the main banking regulator in the United States, is responsible for supervising the banks to ensure that they operate in a safe and sound manner. For the banks to have decided to hedge their interest rate risk in early 2022, before interest rates began to climb, they would have had to think that their regulator was wrong, very wrong. This is because the Fed not only failed to see the surge in inflation coming, they played down the risk that they could be wrong. At the end of 2021, the Fed's official forecast was that inflation was going to be somewhere between 2 and 3.2% at the end of 2022. Even the high end of that range missed the actual inflation of 5.3% in December 2022 by a huge margin, not to mention the actual year high of 7%. Amazingly, at the end of 2021, the high end of the range of the Fed's own projection of the Fed funds rate had it going to just 1.1% at the end of 2022. The Fed was so cavalier about the inflation outlook and what they might have to do to contain it that it was no wonder that the banks never felt the urgency to hedge against the upside risk to inflation and interest rates. Why would you bet against your own regulator? Especially if you bet wrong, your regulator would not look upon you kindly. In this sense, the Fed has to share the blame for the massive unrealized losses on the bank's holdings of fixed income securities today. Indeed, the crisis highlights the potential conflict of interest between the dual roles of the Federal Reserve as the center of monetary policy and as also the banking regulator. Can we really rule out the possibility that the Fed might have turned a blind eye to those unrealized losses because they were mindful of their role in their making? If you ask me, Perhaps it is time to think about splitting the Fed's dual roles by creating an independent banking regulator that is not going to take the forecast and guidance from the Federal Reserve at face value. The Fed has one great excuse though. That is the fact that higher interest rates should be good for banks. The higher rates make banks more profitable. The data strongly supports this supposition. Higher Fed funds rates are usually associated with higher net interest margins, which is the difference between what the banks earn on their assets and the cost of their funding as a ratio of their total assets. Indeed, in 2022, the net interest margins of U.S. banks improved dramatically as the Fed started raising interest rates. Net interest margins went up despite the fact that banks were sitting on a lot of low-yielding bonds. What this means is that banks on the whole were able to raise their lending rates faster than their deposit rates. The improving net interest margins was probably the reason why the Fed decided not to make a big deal out of the unrealized losses of the bank's securities holdings. Because these losses imply an improvement in future net interest margins as low-yielding maturing bonds are eventually rolled into higher-yielding ones. The stock market should have looked at the banks the same way, especially given the stock market is supposed to be forward-looking. But the stock market panicked. Instead of focusing on the improving outlook of future cash flows of banks, the market instead decided to focus on their book value. Book value is liquidation value. For many banks, a liquidation scenario means that losses on their securities holdings will wipe out their total equity capital. Investors became extremely short-term oriented. This made banks vulnerable to short sellers, who might have also taken advantage of ignoring depositors to spread fears and drive down stock prices.
panic is a natural reaction when people don't know if they will get their money out of a supposedly troubled bank. The problem with panic is that it often leads to contagion, when depositors start to pull money even out of good banks. Contagion is like when the genie gets out of the bottle. Once it starts, it's very difficult to put it back. In other words, it is difficult to contain contagion once it started. The best course of action, of course, is to prevent contagion in the first place by dealing forcefully with troubled institutions and separating them from the good banks right away. It is very clear that the San Francisco Federal Reserve and the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation failed to do that with Silicon Valley Bank. The San Francisco Federal Reserve should have seen the problem coming and demanded the bank to raise capital much earlier. The FDIC should have immediately found a buyer for the bank when it took over the bank on March 11th. We won't know until there's been a full investigation, but it's difficult to believe that the FDIC could not find a single buyer for Silicon Valley Bank. With 50% of venture capital-backed startups as its clients, Silicon Valley Bank would have boosted the share of any acquirer in the investment banking business associated with American tech industry. For what it is worth, the U.S. government's handling of the Silicon Valley Bank failure has drawn sharp criticism from European financial policymakers, according to the Financial Times. I'm not surprised. It looked amateurish and incompetent. Confidence has been shaken. Many banks, especially regional banks, are still in a very fragile state. Jenna Yellen, the Secretary of the U.S. Treasury, said early in the week that the administration is ruling out a blanket deposit guarantee. It would seem that things are not bad enough for the administration to reach for the nuclear option that could prove costly politically. But that option, meaning blanket guarantee, at least for a limited period, is probably the best thing for the U.S. economy right now and may prove to be the least expensive option for taxpayers. If and when the U.S. government does go down that path, the market will start to think long-term again when it thinks about bank valuation. When that happens, regional banks will look like an attractive buy. I am waiting. If you got something out of this program, please hit like and subscribe to my free YouTube channel. If you want to learn more about my investment strategy, come check us out at davidwuunbound.com. Thank you for listening.